I never particularly know how I'm going to play a scene. It's like us, us as human beings, we don't know when we walk into a room how we're going to react. We just react in the moment. So that's what you try and do as an actor. Well, certainly what I try and do. Hello, GQ. This is Killian Murphy, and I am going to answer some questions about Oppenheim. In a previous GQ interview, you said you felt like you weren't Bruce Wayne material. <laughs> Did you feel that way with Oppenheimer? Uh, yeah, I certainly wasn't Bruce Wayne material, I don't think. Maybe could have played Bruce Wayne, but maybe not Batman. But that's um, a different story. I always feel about parts that if it's easy or that I can do it, then I don't really want to do it. It has to feel like a challenge. It has to feel impossible. It has to feel like a huge undertaking. And certainly with Oppenheimer, he is this iconic 20th century figure and we are all living in a world that Oppenheimer created. So it, it was huge, huge part and I recognized the scale of it. But that's, that's what you want as an actor. That's what you want. You want to be pushed. You want to be challenged. And so it was a huge challenge, but one that I embraced. What was your favorite piece of your Oppenheimer wardrobe? <laughs> I mean, I should say the hat, shouldn't I? But um, I didn't keep any of it hated the pipe. It took me a long time to figure out the pipe, even though that's probably technically a prop. I loved the suits. I love the tailoring of the suits. I love those high-waisted pleated pants. They're very flattering, I think, to men, but nobody wears them anymore. Bring them back, I say. How did you feel about J. Robert Oppenheimer before you started, and how did you feel when you finished the role? I've been asked this question a lot, and the only answer that I can give that I think makes any sense is that I felt that he was intensely human and I felt that despite his sort of uh, one in a million generational genius that he had that he was still as flawed and as contradictory and as fallible as the rest of us are as human beings you know the, his brilliance I treated it le less like a gift and more like a burden in order to play the humanity of him they won't fear it until they understand it and they won't understand it until they've used it when the world learns the terrible secret of Los Alamos, our work here will ensure a peace mankind has never seen. And the other thing is I don't really go into to, to projects to try and learn about characters. I try to understand them. I never particularly know how I'm going to play a scene before I get into it. I mean, I'll know the lines, but you know, like it's like us, us as human beings, we don't know when we walk into a room how we're going to adjust to the, to, the, to the changing dynamics. We just react in the moment. So that's what you try and do as an actor. Well, certainly what I try and do. Is it true you were only eating almonds for dinner and during film? <laughs> no, this is apocryphal. I think Emily was being very sympathetic to me and uh, said, oh, Killian only had one almond a day. I mean, I had a bit more than that. I didn't really have enough room in my brain to be socializing with, with the ca rest of the cast and crew at that time because of so much work to do and, you know, I was kind of reducing calories and all that stuff. So it's just I didn't, uh, I didn't go out for dinner or any of that stuff, but I had more than one almond a day. For sure, I wouldn't recommend anyone exists on an almond a day. What was it like shooting in Oppenheimer's actual Los Alamos house? That was amazing. The whole film was shot on location. There was only one studio build, I think, in the whole shoot. And many of the locations were the actual locations where the events went down historically. I remember myself and Emily Blunt walked into it and you can feel there's an energy in the room. There's some vibrations molecularly in that space that you feel that you know that these actual people have, have have lived there and it certainly adds something to your performance it can't help but but do that and we shot in berkeley on the campus where he would have taught and chris always has tried to do that that scene after the bomb is dropped in japan he tries to give that speech that was shot in los alamos in fuller lodge where the scientists used to gather again you feel these these waves of energy, these kind of resonances, and I think it adds something to a performance. I can't put my finger on what it is, but I believe energetically it does change, change the actors and the crew, and everybody feels the significance and the import of what we're doing. You know? How has your working relationship with Christopher Nolan evolved since Batman Begins through Inception and Dunkirk to Oppenheimer? Well, I remember when we first started working, we had no kids, and now he has four and I have two. So that's one thing that's changed and evolved. His vision has become more refined. I think he really, really knows very clearly the sorts of stories that he wants to tell. The way he tells the stories in terms of how he presents them in terms of the IMAX format, I think has, has been refined and honed and is unlike any other filmmaker 
on the planet. I think our relationship has deepened. You know, I think anytime you re-collaborate with someone that many times, which has been six times over 20 years, I think you develop this shorthand that becomes almost um, like telepathy. You know, we can understand what needs to happen in a scene without talking that much. And that's why people re-collaborate, I think, f because of that. Because you, you can just cut through all the getting to know you and testing the waters and just go straight to the work. Sometimes the, the themes and the scenes are, are so large and what you're trying to tackle, and like particularly on Oppenheimer, because it was the greatest moral dilemmas that a human being could possibly un sort of uh, begin to wrestle with or undertake. I mean, you know, they thought when they were going to test the bomb, there was a chance they were going to vaporize the world. So, you know, you don't really have to discuss that. Trying to smash into nucleus, releasing neutrons to smash into other nuclei. Criticality, point of no return, massive explosive force. But this time, the chain reaction doesn't stop. It would ignite the atmosphere. He and I have a similar taste in terms of performance. And I knew from the beginning that the performance would have to be quite interior. And I think he, he understood that too. And he was shooting on these, you know, these large form of cameras, which meant that he was treating the face kind of as a landscape, which he hadn't done before with them. So I knew that I could have this interiority with the performance. And, and he trusted me with that. So you said before that Christopher Nolan makes big films feel like small films. Does that apply to Oppenheimer? Did I say that? You know, he makes films about, about human beings. Um, but he's interested on, in, in, in big, big themes. It makes them on a, on a big scale. But when you're shooting them, it certainly feels like it feels like an independent film because there's just Chris, there's just uh, one camera, there's the boom mop, and there's the actors, there's no video village. There's none of the sort of trappings of conventional studio huge movie that you normally expect. So it feels very intimate. So even when you're filming with that IMAX in mm. your face, how did you get through? Well, I've been working with Chris for so long now, I'm kind of used to them. It, it's, not, it's not really a big deal. And the only thing about them is they make a tremendous racket but then we do a sound take afterwards. So, you know, you, you, you get used to the environment. It feels like a laboratory when you're working on a Chris Nolan set because you're free to experiment and try and make a fool of yourself. And he loves actors. He's incredibly curious about actors. So it feels, it always feels like a very small, private, safe environment. What was the most difficult scene for you to shoot? It was all a challenge. I really liked the the hearing scene at the end, which cuts backwards and forwards to when they're trying to take away his security clearance and they're just humiliating him in this tiny, shitty, awful little bureaucratic room. And we shot it in a room just like that. And we had the whole crew in there and the IMAX camera. And to me, it felt like my days in theater where, you know, it was just a, this company of actors, this troupe of actors. And we would just go at it day after day. And there were these long, long dialogue scenes and this huge kind of one-on-ones or tete-a-tetes with Jason Clark and then, you know, Emily Blunt would come in and do her wonderful work. It was at the end of the shoot and we shot it for about two weeks, I think. So all these actors, these incredible actors are coming in and giving their testimony, but it was also their final scene on set. So there's this emotionality to it because we'd finished and we were all kind of saying goodbye in real life. Um, and then of course we did the final, that final kind of climactic scene where you kind of feel... Position at Los Alamos. I would have done anything I was asked to do. Well, then you would have built the H-bomb too, wouldn't you? I couldn't. I didn't ask you that, Doctor! It's almost like his whole psyche is kind of exploding in the room. And of course, with Chris, he did that practical, like blew the wall out and stuff like that. And um, sh sh all that crazy light and everything. And that was the, the segment of the shoot that I loved the most. I love being out in the desert as well, except it was fucking freezing, which is not supposed to be in a desert. Was there a source material piece that you reference frequently? I think with, with all projects, the script is your most valuable resource always, because that's what's going to end up on, on screen. With this, we also had American Prometheus, the book which Chris adapted for his screenplay. And then there is just endless, endless amounts of uh, um, reading material available on, on Oppenheimer and that time. And there's, there's so much archive footage available. So I sampled from all of it and used all of it and I was kind of working on two different uh, tracks. I was kind of doing the academic part, the high kind of intellectual part, and then I was doing the physical part. And then there was a third track that was just the kind of instinctual part. They all kind of fed into to eventually what became the performance. I love research uh, and Chris loves prep, so that worked. But I think when you get on set, you can't be finished. Do you know what I mean? The character can't be, be there 
it has to evolve over the shoot. Um, so it's always a work in progress all the time. And for me, acting is, is always a, is an instinctual exercise, not an intellectual one. I love reading and I love absorbing all the information, but ultimately when you get on stage, it has to be um, emotional and truthful. All the academia in the world ain't gonna help you then, you know. What are your thoughts on practical effects versus CGI? Well, again, because um, I've worked with Chris for so long and I'm such a fan of how he makes and presents films, I, I really believe that the audience responds in a different way to in-camera real effects. And I think we've become so sophisticated at consuming films and that horrible word content. We uh, are much more cynical, I think, about uh, effects that don't look true and truthful. And I know it isn't um, possible all, all the time, but I'm, I'm very much of the belief that when it can happen in camera, it should. Certainly from a performer's point of view, when you're in the real environment and effects are happening around you, it does something to you and how you respond, you know, that transfers uh, um, to the camera and it, and, it, and it kind of electrifies the performance, you know. I mean, I remember on Inception, that first scene where I meet um, Leo in a bar and Chris wanted the water and the glass to tilt. So he built the whole set on a gimbal so that the whole set would tilt like that. So we all were going like this on that set, you know, and that you feel that as performers. So it does something to how you perform. The day you finished filming, how did you celebrate being able to step out of your Oppenheimer brain? How did I do? Uh, I probably had a big sandwich and a pint of Guinness or something like that. It takes a while when you're deep into the work and you've been playing a character like that for such a long time. And I'm not talking about sort of me the method or anything like that. I'm just talking about the focus, doing it for that long with all the prep for, you know, 15, 16, 17 hours a day, and there's an abrupt stop. There's, you have an awful lot of displaced energy. You're neither, you're neither the character you're, or yourself, you're somewhere in the middle. And yeah, it takes a, it takes a minute. It takes, it, takes, it, takes, it takes longer than that, but you know, you go on a holiday and you hang out with your family, and then eventually you, you, you find somewhere else to put all that, that kind of focused energy. It's always a little heartbreaking finishing a job, but then you kind of move on. We're just like, it's like a, it's like a traveling circus, you know? What is your favorite historical time period that you've gotten to live through in your roles? Yeah, I seem to have played a lot of characters from the past. I don't know, every time I was playing those characters, they seemed to be living through terrible upheaval and strife. <laughs> and so I'm not quite sure. I mean, the 20s seemed like fun. I'm sure if you had a bit of money, but, you know, but it, and there was great, there was great music in the 20s. I, I, I would have been into that. If I could just step off the set and just go to the clubs and listen to the music, I'd be happy in the 70s or the 20s or even the 50s. I'd be just in the clubs, listen to music.